This is Eleanor Hospice in Gravesend, one of Kent's busiest hospices. A registered charity, Eleanor provides treatment to over 2,500 people, requiring care and support right across the county. The care that they deliver is free for people of all ages. 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. I have my own little motto, and it's live life hard and fast and every day as if it's your last. You know, life is precious. When people realise they have a shorter time than they thought was likely, actually every moment matters. Their 200 strong staff and 600 volunteers are dedicated to making people's remaining days the best they can be. It's about just letting that person just leave the ward with dignity and respect. I'm sure every nursing profession cares, but there's something special about hospice. Hi. Eleanor doing? also take their support and treatment right into people's homes. To have a really good cry is amazing. You may think a hospice is a place people come to die. Some people think as soon as you say the word hospice, that's the end of the road. But it's actually a place people come to live. There's a huge amount to offer. It is full of fun. It is full of laughter. You need to live life to the full. You don't know what's around the corner. So let's make the most of what we've got. It's 9am Thursday morning at Eleanor Hospice Gravesend and training facilitator Sue Marshall is greeting her students for the day. Sue is undertaking a radical new programme at the hospice which aims to transform ward assistants into care volunteers. Hi ladies, how are you? Yeah, fine, thank yeah. you. Okay, so week three, how have you recovered from last week? Yeah, it was a bit yeah. manic. OK. Looking um, forward to today, I am. Mm. Are you? Yeah. OK. Sharon and Pauline are two such volunteers and are just a few weeks into their care volunteer training programme. So from ward volunteer to care volunteer, you're going to be much more interactive with patients and families and reporting back to the nurses and questioning the nurses. You may have time where you'll talk to the doctors that are in the building. So don't be afraid to ask questions. If there's something you're unsure of, ask. This is all going towards you growing as a care volunteer and supporting Eleanor in a much more caring role than you were before. Sharon's quite a new volunteer to Eleanor and she definitely is showing signs of potential of being a fantastic asset to Eleanor. I'd like to think in three years' time she might decide to come back to Eleanor as a staff nurse. So, you ready? Yes. Let's do it. Bring it on. Bye. Bye. Good morning, Eleanor. How can I help you? So, we've just had a, a phone call for a gentleman that's currently at home. Um, he's with his wife. Um, he's got metastatic lung cancer, but he's had a new diagnosis of multiple brain metastases. Unfortunately, his wife is finding it very difficult at present with coping with his needs at home, so he's coming to us for respite care. Arriving at Eleanor is Brian Cole. Brian has lung cancer, which has now spread to his brain. The side effects of this development have been life changing and his symptoms now include numbness, difficulty in standing and acute confusion. We're going to take good care of your wife as well, all right? Yes. So you have nothing to worry about her or you, OK? She's special, mate. I'm sure she is. Brian's symptoms have brought his wife Jenny close to breaking point emotionally. So to allow her some much needed rest, Eleanor are taking Brian in for some respite care for five days. The wife is very tired, uh, very stressed, because it is very difficult to cope at home on your own uh, with someone as uh, poorly as him. Um, so it's important that we can take good care of him and also his wife. Hi, I'm Dr. Hello, hello. I'm Jenny, I'm his wife. Yeah. Right, OK, right. Nice to see you. Yeah. Overseeing how Brian and Jenny are getting along is Dr. Shiraz Majid. All right, so I think we'll go in and uh, say hello to him. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, hi, pleased to meet you. My name is Dr. Majid. I'm a consultant here. 
I pretty much know everything that I need to know from, from the history. Yeah. It's been kind of quite a drastic journey in the last few months, unfortunately. It has. Right. Are you having any pains at the moment? No. no. When you get the pains, whereabouts are the pains? Right. Okay. Here, okay. Right. Okay. I think it seems like his disease is quite progressive, unfortunately. Um, he's got multiple uh, metastases in the brain, and when you're getting seizures, it means that things are deteriorating quite rapidly. We're going to be looking after him, making sure he's comfortable and yeah. dignified yeah. and pain free. Yeah. Um, Counselling, I think you, the session is already arranged yeah, for yourself. Yeah which is uh, pretty good. We will find out the blood results which happened on Friday. Um, and I think the important thing is support for yeah, yourself you. and uh, see how you get on. Yeah. I won't be there forever, will I? No. Uh, we're hoping that once things are a little bit more settled, yeah. especially with your wife, yeah. we will reassess in the next few days. Okay. okay. We'll keep you. I'll be seeing you every day, anyways. Yeah. And then no, we can. I'm not leaving her. No, 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 not at all, not at all. All right. Yeah, Fine. Okay. Nice to see you. Thank you. And uh, we'll carry on, as I said. Okay, and and, and I'll be, you know, I'll be, yeah. I'll be seeing him every day. Yeah. This is uh, one of the very common scenarios that we see, uh, witness in our practice, uh, patients who are going through the last moments of their lives and even weeks. Sometimes it can be overwhelming and challenging for the families. So we thought it was necessary to bring him in. It gives her a little bit of rest and then we can support her from the counseling point of view, offering her the services that we have so that she's well supported. Okay. All right? Okay, thank All right, you. nice to thank see you. you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Bye now. Bye. Meanwhile, across the corridor, day patient Sheila is catching up with her friends. Sheila is suffering from secondary bone cancer after initially having breast cancer 30 years ago. I was actually 44 when I was diagnosed uh, with the breast cancer in 1984. And um, I had a mastectomy, uh, which was absolutely... Uh, yeah, knocked me for six, 44. I still felt, you know, I had a lot of living to do. It took me about, about a year to really come to terms with the fact that um, I'd lost a breast and, um, and the, all that goes with that. I then um, I just carried on with life and I didn't, I, I didn't even think about it. And then my husband died five years ago. And I'm never sure whether it was the stress of losing my husband or that it was just my time, so it is, it is spreading, it's what it is, but I just feel so lucky that I've had that 30 odd years to see grandchildren and great grandchildren. So I've been coming here for three years now. But I do actually leave at 12.30, I don't stay till three o'clock because I've got a, uh, well he's not a puppy now, he's two, but I don't like leaving him for too long as I live on my own, so he does miss me that once a week. Hi Sheila, how are you feeling today? Yeah, really good. His name is Rocky and he's a little uh, Shih Tzu Chihuahua cross. Uh, very needy. <laughs> uh, naughty uh, sleeps on my bed. <laughs> I would love to bring him in, but he's very good at um, cocking his leg up everywhere and I don't think they'd appreciate that. But uh, I know everyone would absolutely adore him. And he's my lifeline, <laughs> my reason to get up in the morning. <laughs> Back on the inpatient's ward, and Brian is being given an early lunch by wife Jenny. We've been under their care ever since he was diagnosed as being terminal when we knew it had spread to the brain. So for about 13 or 14 months, we've actually been under the care of the Eleanor. They do home visits and assess how he's going and, and obviously alter his drugs if he needs any different drugs and things like that. But the impact on me has been terrible, really. You don't realise it sort of builds up and builds up. I've been quite angry with him at times. Fine. Okay. That's it. You got it. You've got it. 
I was really very, very active. I swim, do Zumba, keep fit, yoga, all stuff like that. And I'm really, it's not the whole lot on the head because he's so confused now that he forgets where I've gone. To be able to get out is almost impossible. And this week that he's going to have here will allow me a bit of breathing space for a week before he comes back home again. You're stabbing at air. He smoked um, for many years, gave up about eight years ago. Sort of makes me really angry because I feel he's brought this illness on himself by smoking. And he watched his mum die of a terrible lung cancer because she was a really heavy smoker. Um, would have thought that would have been enough to put him off, but it obviously didn't. So I, th I think that's where the anger stems from, really, with me, because I feel like he's thrown everything away, really. We've been together for 51 years and it's, you know, it's sort of all of a sudden there's no future. So it's quite hard. You managed to get your food all right. It's 10.30 and training facilitator Sue has an important job for volunteer and aspiring nurse Sharon. How do you feel about going round to the ivy room where we store the people that have died where we look after them. Checking the morgue and the inventory is a really important part of everyday work here at Eleanor. We need to make sure that the fridges are all in good condition and working accurately and that the patients in them are being looked after well. And for the care volunteers, it's part of our work. It's a big part of our work. How do you feel about going around there? Slightly apprehensive, but fine. I've been volunteering for Eleanor for a couple of weeks and one thing I have steered cleared of is the mortuary. Um, that does fill me with a slight bit of anxiety. I'm not sure what to expect and how they are going to be in there. Um, so yeah, I'm a bit nervous about that at the moment. Fine. You don't have to do it, Sharon. If you don't want to do it, it's absolutely fine. No, it's fine. You yeah, sure? I'll do it. Yeah, it's OK. Because Sharon wants to be a nurse, this is a great opportunity for her to overcome some hurdles that other nursing students just aren't going to have the opportunity to do. What I'll do, I'll be, I'll be there. Yeah. OK, so mm -hmm. if you want to stop, that's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do, I'm going to ask you to go and check how many people are around in the morgue. OK, and we'll cross-reference that with what's logged in the diary. Okay, also, yeah. at the top, you'll see um, a digital reading of the fridge temperature. Mm -hmm. So I need you to take a note of that for me. Yeah. Is that OK? okay. All right. Yeah? Great, okay. thank you. If they can come here and they can deal with death and dying and grieving, I think that's a huge step forward for them for their career path. It's 11 a.m. at Eleanor, and there's a buzz circulating amongst the reception staff. Today might be an exciting day. I've heard one of our patients might be bringing her dog in, so I've got my dog treats ready to go and meet him. It's important to make people feel welcome, and if you can make that, if they bring a pet in, and you can make their pet feel welcome, that actually makes them feel better as well. Just down the corridor, a very special guest has arrived at the hospice. Day patient Sheila has plucked up the nerve to bring her dog Rocky to the hospice to cheer up the other patients. She has her fingers crossed Rocky will behave himself. Hi Sheila, how are you? Hi Carol. You alright? Yes, I'm Hello, fine. Hello Rocky, welcome. Welcome to Eleanor. Yeah. Welcome to Eleanor. Yeah, how was the journey? Him. It's good. All yeah, right. he was good. Well was he behaved. Okay in the car? Yes, he's fine and good. he's behaving better than I thought he would. Yeah. <laughs> he's lovely. Okay. Yeah. Um, Going to bring him to meet some of the other patients. Yes. Yes? Okay. Come and have a seat. Thank you. 
if I let him down, Carol, um, I hope he doesn't cock his leg <laughs> and mark his territory. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure he won't. And um, I've got some disinfectant wipes anyway. So oh, lovely. Thank we'll you. deal with it. You oh, won't, yeah. will you, Rocky? One person who's very happy to see Rocky is receptionist and fellow dog lover Diane. <laughs> Hello. Hello. What have I got? Oh, he likes those. Oh. Yeah. Here we go then. I'd like to welcome everybody, um, be that adults, children or dogs. Oh, you're so lovely. Oh, thank you. I've got yeah, kisses. Yeah, thank, yeah. thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, you're more than welcome. But if I'm honest, I'm not doing it j just to make the dogs feel welcome. I get a nice little stroke of a cute little dog as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, good oh, boy. Wow. Good. Good boy. Yes. That's it, no more. No more, thank you. Yeah. Hey. I might start bringing him in on Mondays, actually, oh, now that'd I've be seen lovely, him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you've made my day. Thank oh, you very thank much. You. Thank you, Rocky. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> see you. On the other side of the hospice, Head of Wellbeing Dr Russ Hargreaves has booked in a meeting with the wife of a patient who he's concerned about. So I'm just about to see a lady called Jenny. She's a carer for a gentleman called Brian. And we're very, very worried that Jenny's reached a point where she's finding it very difficult to cope with looking after Brian. So she's had some counselling sessions and I just want to follow up on those and find out how she is. Jenny, I was just wondering how you're feeling at the moment. Um, I feel um, a bit more relieved now. I know he's been here for the week, so it's taken some of the pressure off. Um, I think the anxiety and, and the um, frustration comes when he's back at home again and you're constantly having to watch, I mean, everything really, even when he's eating his meals, making sure he's not choking on it and you've constantly got to be listening out to make sure that he's, he's safe really and, that, and that's quite a responsibility when it's just you there on your own. So there's no time for you to switch off? No, not really, no. Even at night, I'm sort of half listening to see if he's coughing or... Mm -hmm. I mean, if I have a night where I don't hear him at all, I think, oh, my God, I hope nothing's happening. I'm not going to go down and find that he's dead, you know, yeah. because that is the thought that goes yeah. through your head. Yeah. If I hear him coughing, in some ways, I'm relieved because I know he's still OK. Yeah. Yeah. Jenny's been married to Brian for a very long time and, and nobody trains you to do this. You know, a life-limiting illness comes along and it completely knocks you off your feet. And she's looking after him 24 hours a day. Their relationship has changed beyond measure. I'm just wondering what the purpose of this, um, this inpatient stay was because I'm very, very aware that things were becoming very difficult for yeah, you. Yeah. And is that where we are at the moment? Yes, it's is... really because I felt like I was um, going to boil over. I think... Um... The last day or so before the weekend, he'd been particularly confused and it was just driving me absolutely mad, you know, and just giving him the same answers to the same questions over and over again. And I suppose it must have been building up without me realising and I just felt that I couldn't cope with him really anymore for a bit. Yeah. Carers often reach a crisis point. They reach a crunch point where they just can't do anymore. They can become quite angry and frustrated with their loved one, and they don't mean to do that. Um, but it's a very, very natural thing that happens. And at that point, we need to really make sure that we look after the carers as much as we're looking after patients as well. So hopefully he's settled here. Yeah. What, what can we do for you? What can we do to make this any better for you? My main problem, I think, um... If I knew I could get out and do the things I wanted to do, I'd be in a better frame of mind to cope with him mm -hmm. the other times. And I think that is the main thing that's the irritating thing and the thing that, that I get wound up about is the fact I can't get out yeah. without getting somebody in to sit with him and that becomes increasingly difficult. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably where the frustration with me lies and where it builds up is because I'm not able to do the things that I want to do. During Brian's stay here, we'll do as much counselling and complementary therapies and support for Jenny, but way beyond that as well, we need to start looking after her and make sure that she's at the best place that she can be so that Brian will be in the best place that he can be. So that means that this week should hopefully be sorted. Yeah. You can hopefully yeah. do as much as you feel able yeah. to do yeah. and, and rest as much as you want to exactly. as well. And then we'll, we'll take it yeah. beyond that. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. At 
the other side of Eleanor, volunteer Sharon is facing up to one of her biggest fears in the hospice mortuary. Okay, so we're going to go through to the morgue. Are you comfortable? Yeah. Yeah? Just stop at any time, mm -hmm. all right? And walk away is absolutely fine. Just go as far as you want, all right? Okay. For Sharon, her dreams of becoming a palliative care nurse were cemented after observing how Eleanor looked after her own father. Two years ago, my dad was under the care of Eleanor and in their home care team. And I saw what they'd done, not only for my dad, but for my family and how absolutely lovely they were. And that has what has drawn me to Eleanor. Yeah. There's lights here. Mm-hmm. All right. Good. Okay. I've only seen one dead person before, so not really sure what to expect. But for me, it's part of what I'm doing here. So, yeah, I'll do it. Yep, yeah, so when you're comfortable, if you want to go down and open the door, is that okay? okay? Yep. All right. When I take trainee um, care volunteers to the morgue for the first time, one can react very differently to the next. Some people can find it very peaceful and calm and real, and other people can find it very sad. Um, it just depends on the individual, and we have to be prepared to coach them through whatever their reaction might be. to explain but to say it was better than what I thought I don't know if that's the wrong way of saying it but actually it was um, he looked really at peace um, and like I said he had a flower on his pillow uh, I don't know whether a nice experience is right but it's actually put my mind at rest and my apprehension is actually gone now Okay, I think you turned great. I think you need a cup of tea now. I do. Yeah, let's right. go. Okay. So I think Sharon coped extremely well. Um, she wants to be a nurse, so she's got her sight set. So she knows that doing something like this is really important. Um, I think she coped really well. It's lunchtime at Eleanor, and palliative care nurse specialist Linda has received an urgent call to visit a cancer patient at home. Last week we met Karen Hall, who is suffering from gallbladder cancer and was hoping that the disease was under control. However, there has been a development. We saw Karen last week in clinic um, following a relaxation class um, due to increased pain. Um, at that point, it was felt that this pain could be diverticulitis, which gave Karen lots of reassurance. Unfortunately, 24 to 48 hours later, she um, had increased pain, <coughs> had to go to the hospital, um, and was found out that the pain was actually progression of her disease. But potentially, this is looking at, at very life-limiting for Karen. Well, she was discharged from hospital last night, but she's rung up today quite upset. She's in a lot of pain, she can't settle, um, and she's quite emotional. So we said we'd go out, offer her some support, and just see how we can help her over the weekend and see what plans we can get in place for her. Hi, Gary, how are you doing? Nice to see can you. I come in? Yeah, of course you can. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so you've just come out of hospital now, and obviously you're home today. How are you feeling to start with? Well, I was feeling a bit brighter, wasn't I, myself? Yeah. But obviously we was apprehensive about, you know, coming home because things have changed so much that it's the coming to terms with, is this, is this um, how it's going to be going forward? Or is the light at the end of the tunnel where 
I can get my fitness back, you know. But I think Eleanor are there to offer help and support. And we've got our healthcare assistants that can come in and help, maybe just helping you have a bit of a wash and get dressed in the mornings to give Gary time for that, that time to do something else. We've had the discussion. Well, yeah, the trouble is I wouldn't do anything else. You wouldn't do anything? <laughs> no. no. So you want to carry on? Yeah, we, I'm we, quite we, happy we, carrying on as I am. At the moment, we've had that discussion. Yeah. And it is early stages, and I understand that sometimes things change. Yeah. But at the moment, we're just going to, you know, with do the this. help and support of the Eleanor, we're hoping to sort of muddle through this next This is This days. is our issue. The chair. Seating and, during the and day. And sleeping. OK. Because the problem with 10 days in a hospital bed, it's left me with a really terrible backache okay. and I can't seem to get comfortable, whether it's in a chair, whether it's in a bed. Right. Yeah. Anywhere. Anywhere. Okay. Um, the trouble we're coming across today, and that's why we're so desperate today, yeah. is everything... 15 he's, days delivery. You know, fifth, you know, Four weeks delivery, six weeks everything delivery. Everything is waiting for a delivery right. and yeah. I can't... I can't wait. No, you know, we need to find you something yeah. fairly, fairly quick. Well, I, what I'll do is I can go back. I'll, I'll look on the um, ordering system and see if there's something we can get in. And if they're in stock, we can do it as a fairly urgent order rather than waiting weeks. Yeah. Yes. That would be good. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming out That's at such right. short notice. That's all right. I had a slot today. You were lucky. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Back in Gravesend, Director of Patient Care Jackie Hackett is preparing a special award for a long-serving care volunteer. Today I'm going to present one of our volunteers with a certificate and badge because she's been volunteering with us for five years. At Eleanor we have over 600 volunteers that help us deliver the care to our patients and their families and they work throughout the hospice. They bring such a wealth of experience and skills with them. Um, it, they're just essential and an integral part of Eleanor and the care that we actually give here. and gentlemen, I just wondered if I could just have your attention for a little while. Ladies, my name's Jackie, I'm the Director of Care here and today I'm really, really pleased um, to be able to give an award um, to one of the volunteers that you know really, really well who's been helping support us now for, for over five years. And Frida, I would just like to say thank you so much for everything that you do to help us here, particularly in day therapy. We are so grateful for, for your help and support. So I'd just like to present you, you with your five years badge and you. your certificate. Thank you very much. It's been a privilege, really. Um, it's something that I'd set myself to do when I retired and I get enormous pleasure from helping the patients in the day therapy unit. I've learned that um, people, I think, enjoy talking to volunteers because they sometimes share information with volunteers that they might not share with the professional staff. So it's quite a privilege to be part of that. Those five years have gone very quickly and I hope to make another five years. Perhaps ten, who knows? So we've just been back from Karen. We obviously came out on a crisis visit following her discharge yesterday. Um, I thought I was going to go out to Karen being in much more of an emotional state, but actually her main issue seems to be the pain in her lower back um, and the need for a comfortable chair in her house. He went to hospital, he had two units of guards, fluids, um, and from there... Um, he... a, a chair seems a very small part of Karen's needs at the moment, but actually for Karen that was her priority all the way through. If she's not comfortable in her chair, she's not going to be able to settle, she's not going to be able to sleep, and her anxiety levels are going to increase as well. So I think for the general public a chair may seem something very menial, but... For me, working as an Ellen, a nurse, it's of major importance. And actually, if I can help her today with just that one thing, then I think I will actually feel like I have done a part of my job well today and just relieved her and her family's anxiety regarding her comfort at home. 
Hi, yeah, I'm just ringing up about um, delivery of a chair for one of my patients that we need urgently. Um, is there any chance that this delivery could be in, in the next 48 hours? No, only two weeks. Um, is there any other chairs that I could order that have got a reduced delivery time? No, okay. No, no special order ones or anything. No. Okay, no problem. Thanks for your help. Bye. The waiting time at shops for chairs is too long, so I think what I'm going to do is try and pull some strings now here, see if I can talk to some people, maybe loan them a chair on a short-term measure until they can get a proper chair for Karen at home. Hi, Bob. Hi, I'm Hello, right, just I'm I've got a lady that's just been discharged from hospital and we really need a chair for her at the moment. I just wondered, are we allowed to loan out these chairs at all on a um, short-term basis? You really need to speak to Jackie on that because okay. of infection control risk. Okay. Um, okay. If Jackie says we can, then that's fine. Okay. And you just get them to sign the disclaimer file. Okay, I'll go up and talk to Jackie. Okay, all right, thanks Thank a lot. You. No, it's not a standard procedure to lend chairs out or any equipment out, Eleanor, but I think for Karen it's really important that she has somewhere to sit comfortably over the weekend and it would have a major impact on how she feels and also how she feels about the Eleanor service in general. No, I'm not going to give up with the chair. I'm going to try my hardest to get a chair and see who... I will talk to anyone who will listen to me to get a chair. <laughs> and then I may even have find someone that will deliver the chair for me as well because the poor family have only got a little hatchback car so I'll pull all my strings and use all my charm <laughs> Earlier trainee care volunteer Sharon successfully faced her fears when she visited the morgue now her colleague Pauline is having to face up to her own very personal concerns You right, Pauline? Oh, not really. It was a bit hard in there. It was a bit upsetting, really. So I went and have a chat with Sue. Um, I just spoke to Jenny. She said that you'd been with a patient and you might want to chat. You OK? Yeah, I am. I was just a little bit shocked, I think. Um, well, Sharon and I had gone in to help the gentleman who wanted to go to the loo. OK. Apparently he's having difficulty in that area. Um, and he'd been sat there for a long time, hadn't he, Sharon? Mm. But he obviously passed something and mm. it was just the first time I've actually come face to face with... Someone Who? else's? Yeah, and it's ridiculous. No, why is it ridiculous? My own babies, I wouldn't have thought twice. Okay. My grandchildren, I wouldn't think twice. All right. Okay. And it's something we all do. Right. Why, why do I find it so awful that it's somebody else's? Okay. And at the end of the day, that could be me in a bed and somebody thinking that about me. I'd be mortified. Mm. Did you run out of the room, Pauline? No. No. Do you think he was aware that you was struggling? Sharon? I like to think not. No, absolutely no way. I didn't realise you were struggling until you came wow. out of the room. But I'm hoping that now that I've done that once, mm. when I'm faced with that situation again, okay. I will be able to, to deal with it. OK. I am so proud of Pauline today. She's faced her fears. She's come out the other side of it smiling. Our patient is happy and is none the wiser of what she's been through. And, yeah, she's done fantastic. Really good. Done a great job. Well done, you. Yeah. You should be really proud. I've yet to meet anybody without a fear, and you've just conquered one of yours big time. Well done. Uh, thank you, Sue. I really value your support. To be a good care volunteer, you have got to have a degree of strength. You've got to be prepared to face your demons, think about your challenges, and if you can get over a phobia or a fear, it's going to make you a much better carer, which is going to benefit the patient.
It's 4pm in Gravesend and Head of Wellbeing Dr Russ Hargreaves is heading out of the hospice to visit a terminally ill cancer patient. So we're just off to see uh, a guy called Trevor um, and he was diagnosed very, very recently with, a, with quite an advanced cancer. So things have happened very quickly for him. Um, and he's got two very young children. He's actually a grandparent, but he has parental responsibility for two young kids. Um, so I've done a bit of work with, with the whole family, just trying to prepare them for, for what's gonna happen. But Trevor and his partner, Kath, have got some really interesting ideas about life and death. And he's very, he's very straightforward. He's very prepared for, for the fact that he's gonna die. Um, so, so it's about readying the whole family for that, really, and, and, and then living with the uncertainty of, of when that might happen. Hello, only me. <laughs> my, my cancer is terminal, you know. And I've got not a great time to live, but that has given me the opportunity to get, if you like, our house in order. You know, I've got all, I've got all the loose ends tied. We've got all the funeral arranged. We've, we know exactly what we're doing. When it gets time, I want to go into the hospice. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to pass away here. Okay. Because of the upset and that for the children. Yeah. No? Yeah. No. 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 You know, I don't want them accidentally seeing something that could be very upsetting to her. I, you know, I don't want that, you know. You know, I would, I, I, I would be much happier and more at ease with myself if I'm taken into the hospice and just looked after for those last day or two, mm -hmm. you, know, you, know, you know, so I'm away from the children. Yeah. Know? I mean, you know. When you get to that stage, it's not about you. It's not about you mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's about the other people that are going to be affected by it. And it's very important that we know I, that as well, I, that that's what your wishes I, are. I, yes. Mm. But I'm sure you're aware that not everyone has the same attitude as you. Does Kath share your views on this as well? I'll ask. We'll ask us, shall we? Could do. Kath? I was just asking Trevor whether you and whether you and he share the same attitude about his, his ideas of death. He's very he's very black and white, isn't he, about about death. Yeah, we we both come to terms with it yeah. very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's there's nothing to be gained by constantly walking around sad and worrying about it. Mm -hmm. I always say to him, I'm going to play two pieces of music at your funeral. Yeah. Yeah. One when we're going into the crematorium, which he's knocking on heaven's yeah. door, mm -hmm. and then when we're coming back out of the crematorium. I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm going to haunt you. You know that now. I'm going to haunt you. you know, I, I come, I'm going to come back here and I'm going to haunt you. Yeah, you probably will. <laughs> I call it what it is, you know, and get on and deal with it. Cancer is not a death sentence. Being born is a death sentence because we all get born and we all die. Yeah. I mean, and on that journey, you know, you know, we pick up things along the way, illnesses. Just, and it could be anything. It could be heart disease, it could be brain hemorrhage, it could mm -hmm. be many of those things will kill you. So just because the word is cancer, you know, why fly up in the air in blind panic? Mm -hmm. I mean, would you do it if it was heart condition? Mm -hmm. you know, the chances are you wouldn't, so you know, you know, don't fly up in the air, don't panic about it. Well, I'm always learning on this job, and, um, and but your attitude is quite a unique one and so I've learned a lot as well so when my time comes I hope I've got the same sort of views as you actually which is that you know make the best of it while you're here and and the rest of it will just follow thanks Trev thank you very much see you again bye bye so that was Trevor and I really, I really admire him. I realise that not everyone can have those sorts of views about life and death. What he has to live with now is the uncertainty of when that may happen. And that's, that's undeniably very difficult. 
but as we've seen, he, he just deals with it with such great humour and, and I guess positivity um, and a sense that whatever will be, will, will be. Back at Eleanor, and palliative care nurse Linda's search for a comfortable chair for cancer patient Karen Hall has finally borne fruit. Maintenance supervisor Bob is delivering it to Karen's home today. I think getting a chair delivered for Karen today is going to have a huge impact on, on her, how she responds to healthcare professionals and just how she's going to manage to be at home and she can sit with her family in, in the front room and just be part of, part of her family again. going in as an outside agency going in to help Karen is really important because it does show her that healthcare professionals do care. We're there to respond to any problems as they come up. I think that'll be a lot better. OK then, lovely. Thank Thanks you very much. much. Thanks. Thank you. And hopefully in future it means that she will then, she will use us more and talk to us more and so we can help her through her journey. Which, which has been really rocky up until now, but hopefully we can try and make it a bit smoother for her in the next few weeks. Back to the Eleanor inpatients unit, where the hospice have arranged for physio Andy Loden to give cancer patient Brian a helping hand as he attempts to stand up. OK, right, you ready? Yeah. We're going to go ready, steady, sit, and sit up on sit. Oh. Ready? Steady, yeah. Yeah. sit up your calm, up, 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 up. Brian's lung cancer has spread to his brain, affecting his movement. In addition, he's been confined to his bed since breaking his hip last year. Improving Brian's mobility will be a huge help, not only to him, but also to his wife and full-time carer, Jenny. So at Eleanor, we don't just look after the patients themselves, but we look after all the people that are involved in caring for them in the home environment. And I think um, if we can just help to get Brian back on his feet just a little bit, it's just going to make their life uh, a little bit more uh, manageable when they do get home. Right foot forwards. There we go. Right, you ready? Ready? Yeah. Steady. Stand. Push, 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 push. Go on, up, 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 up. Up tall, up tall, up tall. That's it, up we come. Lovely, yeah. 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 Well, we got bottom up. Brian being here for a week hasn't solved the problem, but it's at least given Jenny a break from um, the demands of looking after him um, every day. And it also gives them the reassurance that we are just a phone call away and we are here to support them in the, uh, the weeks to come. Steady and stand. Push, 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 push with those legs, that's it. I feel a bit more positive because um, the Eleanor are organising um, things that we've been waiting for. I've been able to go out and in, enjoy some time with my friends again. And um, when I'm visiting, I feel that I can spend more time, quality time with him, rather than worrying that I've actually got to attend to everything that he wants because someone else is doing that for me. It's really nice. Just nice to spend some time on the feet. Definitely. If Eleanor hadn't have stepped in, um, it would have been quite difficult for me at home mentally, so, yeah, they've been a lifesaver, really. Stand. Push, 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 push. It's 5pm and the undertakers have arrived to pick up one of Eleanor's recently deceased patients. For training facilitator Sue, getting her volunteers to face their fears has been a big step forward on their path towards a career in nursing. What Sharon and Pauline have um, showed today is that the course is in really good shape. It's effective, um, they've come through their fears, they've not run out the front door, they're still here now, and they're looking for their next challenge. That can only be good for them and for us. So, yeah, I think we've got it right. Working here has definitely made me think differently, and it makes you realise that you want to you want to give the best experience to people at the end of their life. 
because um, it's not only very important for that person and how they're made to feel at the end of their life, but also their family or friends or whoever coming to see them. You want them to know that we're doing the best for them. Which is what I would inevitably want for my family and myself. Who wouldn't?